I now declare the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened in open session. That all council members are present. Shelby Williams will be on Zoom. Our first item is uh, the preliminary agenda is consideration action resulting in executive session. There being none. Our second item is the listening tour report. So good afternoon, good evening, Council. I'm Mike Mallory with Strategic Government Resources, SGR. And I'm very pleased to uh, be able to present this report to you on the listening session. I know you have in front of you um, a report, and I want to go through uh, slide deck and then take any questions that you might have for it for us. So um, the uh, just a quick overview of the program. We had 21 meetings that were held during the month of February. Uh, some were virtual and some were uh, in person. We would have liked to have done all of them in person or most of them in person, but uh, COVID and the weather uh, kept that from being possible. Uh, I do want to say that uh, Stephen and Elizabeth did a phenomenal job of pivoting when they needed to, of making sure everything was uh, put together right, and uh, I can't say enough uh, uh, about their presentation, their work on it. And I also just want to say uh, what an amazing thing it is, innovative-wise, for you as a council to uh, support this, to, to come. Um, sometimes people thought the listening session meant they were going to listen to you. But of course, that was not the way it was supposed to be, and that was not the way it turned. So you're all to be commended uh, for being very innovative, and I know it takes some restraint when people are wanting you to give your opinion, but of course you were there to hear their opinions, and I thought you set a great example for that. Um, the meetings, of course, were held throughout different times, weekdays, on the weekend, some evening, some during the day. So we really tried to have a meeting where anybody could have been a part of if they wanted to. We asked a number of questions most of which were, were discussed in small groups and talked about and then reported out as a group, and we'll get to uh, what the results of those questions were. But at the front end and at the back end, we asked them to give us uh, responses about their um, love for Plano and then later their hopes for Plano, and we created from that a word cloud that you can see really highlights the range of answers that we got. And we asked, what do you love the most about Plano? Uh, parks, the safety, schools, obviously those are things that showed up in a, a large number of people's responses, but also the community and a sense of diversity, um, libraries, location, neighborhood, you can see those. Some The, the, the more often somebody recorded that word, the bigger, of course, the word is in the word cloud. So every word that somebody gave us is represented there, but the ones that are the most common have the biggest uh, font. The second question was, what are some things about our community that you hope never changes? And so just um, to kind of give you an explanation of how this was um, done, we put people in small groups and they talked about those questions and then they came back and reported out and we scribed it and wrote it down to make sure that we recorded not what every individual said, but what the group said. So for example, when you see on public safety, it's 17, that means 17 of the groups throughout the course of February said, this is something that it, we hope never changes. And then you kind of go on down from there. Uh, so in your report, you have all of the responses, but in the PowerPoint, uh, we felt like we would highlight the ones that were the most significant. So in, in terms of number of response. So what, what are they like? Public safety, this is what they hope won't change. Small town feel, the quality of schools, and then right up there with it, city government. 
So that uh, is, uh, I'll comment on that in just a little bit as we come to some, the end. But you can see then also the quality of the community, open green space, parks and rec centers. Those are the things they say, we hope that won't change. We also ask the question, what are some things that we could do better? And we didn't try to defend, define, does we mean the council? Does we mean the city? Does we mean the populace? So we let them define it as they wanted to. But what we heard most often from groups was housing. That, and that's, of course, uh, something that is nationwide. Doesn't matter the size of the city, whether it's a suburb or a standalone city, small town, metropolitan city, this is an issue everywhere, and uh, Plano, no exception. Uh, there was also a desire about, you know, increasing the emphasis on environmentalism, uh, living green. Uh, roads, uh, you know, were talked about positively in many places, but also saying we could do better uh, with roads, which is not uh, uncommon either. You can see also down there near the end, homelessness came up a lot, and there's a lot of concern from the people we heard from about how that can be addressed and, and alleviated. Question four was perhaps the most aspirational, and, and this is about what do you want to be known for as a city? Uh, what, what can, and then what can we do to either earn that reputation or enhance it? So I thought this was a very interesting uh, response. The number one thing people said is we want to be known for being safe. We want to be safe. Uh, closely related or closely aligned with that is quality of life. And then diversity and inclusiveness was um, just as important in terms of the number of groups that said it as quality of life. Also good schools, a suburban feel, and then uh, to be welcoming to business also showed up in a lot of the groups that reported. Question five was about pressing needs. What are some of the needs in the community that we should address? And there is where you see homelessness really was the number one thing people spoke about in terms of groups. Also, that the, the community's aging. And what does that mean? And how does that relate to housing, how's that relate to services, how's that relate to services that will be needed. Uh, roads and traffic, right there with it. And then, um, the, it, really, it's, it's zoning development. How can we continue to, to grow and have good development, but also to not be uh, losing touch with our suburban nature of our city? Then community, uh, recreation, entertainment, infrastructure, education, and, and uh, mental health services all showed up uh, several times as well. But you can see the big four there is development, roads, traffic, aging population, and homelessness. And, and this question was more for the staff and maybe for council, but less about the community and more how can the organization respond? How can we set the kind of example that will inspire others to work with us for the good of the community. And, and the big two, you know, you see, is engage the residents. And we heard a lot of people saying in, in comments, we love this opportunity, we'd like to have it more often. They lacked the, they lacked the fact that you were attempting to engage them. Uh, and then connected with that is communication. And everybody feels like you know, in every organization they're in, we need better communication. And that rose up there as well. The last question that was um, discussed in the group uh, was, what are some things that, is, that are hindering us from working together more effectively? And um, again, there's, there's probably three that I think stand out more than the rest. Uh, one is not finding common ground. And I do think, just to say quickly, I do think events like this, even though it's very arduous and unusual, they help build a sense of common ground. And what we often hear is we have more in common than we thought. 
And when you think aspirationally about what you want your city to be, even though we can disagree on things, many times we discover eh, we really agree more on more than we thought, but we come into it thinking we don't have an, enough common ground. Here again, communication shows up, the desire for, for more of that. And then um, there's a feel from many groups that there's a high barrier to citizen engagement, that they don't know how to get involved, and they maybe have to feel like they jump through too many hoops. Um, again, I think events like the listening tour help uh, change that dialogue a little bit. And then the last question uh, is aspirational before, before the, the last uh, word cloud, and that's 10 years from now, what do we want Plano to have or be that we don't have right now or don't have enough of right now? And again, you see three things really rise to the top more so than the others that are shown on the graph. Um, the first one was we want more entertainment and rec opportunities. And you know, 19 groups said that was important to them, which that's more than any other item we had response-wise. Closely, re uh, close behind that though, was the environment and being making, having made progress in protecting our environment. And then the third one, about which 15 groups identified was public transportation. Obviously you have it, but they would like for there to be much more of that. And um, the others, many, several groups responded to, but you can see a, a, a much bigger uh, differentiation. So the, with the beginning we ask, what do you love the most about Plano? At the end we ask, what are your hopes for Plano. And again, you can see the words that were listed the most often have the biggest font. Community, friendly, safe, um, schools, green, inclusive, accessible, all of those, transportation, all of those have a, a lot of uh, marks uh, from people. So let me, let me just say this kind of in my part closing. One of the things you always see with this when we've done these kinds of events is that um, there's more agreement than people think. Second, that outliers tend to self-identify. They may come in thinking, everybody thinks like me, but after a few discussions, they sort of realize, oh, maybe not everybody does. And uh, I think we saw some of that. But I will say, for the most part, there was a lot of alignment with what we heard. I'd say also, there was a lot of cordiality, very professional and respectful dialogue, even when there was disagreement. The other thing we see, and I think this is true in this case too, that respect for leadership, both elected officials and, and staff, respect for leadership goes up, not down from this. Because when you start hearing a lot of people talk, you realize it's not as easy as I thought it was. And uh, that's, that's uh, common for that. And so I think you really are kind of out there on the edge. You're being innovative. And I uh, think you'll get good um, use out of this data as you begin using it for your strategic planning process. So with that, I'll stop and see council if you have any questions for me. Councilman Homer. Just I'd curious like just for, uh, for the question about 10 years from now, what do you want to see in entertainment and rec opportunities were the highest? Did, did you get specifics on that? Were there any examples that were given? No, not that, I, that we listed like specific things. But, you know, they want more to do. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Councilman Williams. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Were there any real surprises as we went through this? Anything you really weren't expecting? I think I was surprised at um, the response to homelessness, to be honest. I, I, that, I, I heard that you know, in a couple of groups and thought that was kind of a maybe a, a, a specialized group, but it was consistent all the way through. So for me, not living in the city, but working with a lot of cities, um, I was surprised that that was of a great concern, and I think that speaks to the heart of the 
people that live in Plano. Thank you. Mike, um, it, it was a good exercise throughout those, that whole month of February. And I, 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 for us, I see us doing this again. What can we do maybe to encourage more people to participate? Well, if you could keep there from being a pandemic and two ice storms, that would help. That's true. Uh, uh, I, I think one other option, Mayor, that you could do is, I've seen other communities do this, is engage a steering committee that is made up of a couple of members from council and uh, you know has a, some ex officio people from staff, but is really a cross-section of leaders from your community and various dynamics. And elicit their support for their constituency, uh, that, that can help a lot because they become your champions of it. And they're reaching out to their uh, supporters. And you did that to some degree by having it in various places. But it's one thing to say it's at my, my building. It's another thing to feel like I, I'm steering this. So that, I think that would be something to consider uh, for sure. Councilman Grady? Just a, a quick comment, um, and not really a question, but uh, I will be interested to see how we use this in future planning sessions so that we can incorporate some of the thoughts that have been brought up by the citizens in order to really steer the direction of the city. So I commend what we've done. It's uh, it, it certainly is a, a very interesting observation on not only homelessness and, and some of the other things that, that are within the survey, but how do we use this as we begin planning um, in the summer and fall for our next steps? Actually, Councilman, we're going to be bringing this up at the end of the month with our council strategic retreat. This will be one of the items and documents that we talk about is not only um, how to utilize this data in some of our decision making, but also our forward progress in, uh, in hosting future um, events to allow that uh, feedback from citizens to come back to us. So we will have um, it, the data both for decision-making purposes and for future activity purposes. Thank you so much, Mike. We really appreciate all the work you guys did. Thank you, Mayor and, and Elizabeth Council. And, and, and Stephen, staff. thank you as well. We, we yes. appreciate y'all and glad to be partners with you in it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is uh, building inspections, permit process improvements. Celso Mata, Chief Building Official. Good evening, Council. My name is Celso Mata. I'm here to give you our process improvement report. So as you know, we began last year looking at the department. We had a consultant look at uh, several different strategies, and we began in September a uh, project work plan, which started with diagramming solutions of 10 permit types, and a stakeholder list was put together. We also had uh, surveys put together with the stakeholder uh, responding to those surveys after they were sent out in October. In uh, Data review of all the survey and meeting data was put together, again, uh, looking at diagramming workflows. And in November, a draft report was put together looking at different opportunities that we could come up with for considerations. The updated final report was put together in December. And in January, an Opportunities for Improvement memo was issued with 10 items that I will show you here. The 10 items look at a lot of different things. Some of them are our software, which is called Track It. We have certain suggestions on completeness, uh, intake, standardizing plan review comments, looking at field functionality for inspectors, uh, consolidating steps for all permits. So we're gonna go through each one of them, beginning with number one. And also, I would like to point out that the bullet points in blue are the items that we currently have in process or we've already implemented. So number one, explore eTrack at portal improvements. So we do have with our eTrack it for stakeholders the allowance for them to pay online. 
they can view permit status. They can look at plan review comments. So what we do is we have that right now with online permitting for simple mechanical electrical plumbing permits, small jobs like a water heater, things that don't require plans. So we are tasked with collecting that uh, credit card, which is something that has a convenience fee, 2.9%. e -track it cannot collect the fee. So we're, that's why we limit the online permitting. One of the things that is also in item number one is digital file sharing platform, which is about electronic plan review and downloading, or rather uploading at that point, files. We do have right now a website portal that's been created for electronic plan submittal. We've been testing that in the last few weeks and it's looking pretty good. But those are short-term solutions. A long-term solution is a development services solution replacement, the DSSR is what we call it, and that's currently underway. Engineering, planning, fire, building inspections, health, we all got together uh, in January and we began the process of replacing tracking. And so that is currently underway. Number two, educate customers on existing e tracked portal functionality. So we talked about the things Trackit can do, and we do have that posted on our website, and that availability has been there uh, for years. And when we do issue a permit, Staff does inform applicants about e tracked capabilities, but we are obviously not hitting on all cylinders communicating with all stakeholders. So what we've created are e tracked handouts uh, specifically for e tracked So while we're handing them the permit, we're also giving them a flyer on e tracked and it just tells them exactly what to do. We can also send that to them in the link, the entire thing, so they can click on that. There was also a suggestion that we create an educational video, which would outline everything that Trackit can do. And so that's in process and we're working with communications department right now on that. Number three, provide a completeness check during intake. When you come to the department, you bring your plans. And of course, what we do is we, we take your plans and your application. We've always done that. One of the things we're finding out, and we've known for years, is that we don't always get everything we need. Sometimes there's some low-hanging fruit, things that uh, perhaps like, uh, for instance, when you're working on a, uh, on a uh, existing building, an asbestos report is required, that's a state law. Uh, a TDLR uh, requirement for accessibility is required when your project exceeds $50,000. These are things that uh, we should already have but they are part of the plan review comments. So that adds to our review. So we understand that other departments such as planning, if you don't have everything when you come uh, to talk to them, they, will, uh, they don't start that process. So they'll send you back. We are currently uh, having what we call a soft opening. We've created that completeness checklist and we're checking and we're telling customers that in the future, we're, going to, uh, we're not going to accept the plans and we want you to have all these items. Now there's only eight items on the list. So we're gonna check off what they don't have, hand it right back to them. And if there's things that they don't have, they'll know exactly what they need to bring in. And a lot of these things are really simple for them to bring in. So we think that's gonna help us with our review times and help our plan review. Number four, establish recurring check-in meetings with other departments, large projects require building inspections, fire, planning, engineering. We're all reviewing at simultaneously. So what does occur occasionally if uh, while we're working with the customer, perhaps we're through with our review and uh, engineering may not be getting, for instance, everything they need from the customer, civil plans and uh, comments. So uh, we tell the customer we can't issue the permit because you don't have everything in place. We can't issue it until everybody has what they need. So we understand their frustration. So what we're uh, doing now is uh, our proposals every two weeks, the departments will check on projects that we are about to issue and very close uh, to issue a permit and we'll uh, check with each department where we are. So we know that simultaneously we're all about to finish our plan reviews at the same time. 
We actually had that first meeting last week. We have a monthly development services meetings every month. We've had that for years. We're all in the same room. And uh, that item was added to the agenda. And so we'll keep doing that every two weeks. Number five, standardize the plan of view process. So there is a, uh, a suggestion, obviously, a, a request for electronic submittal and review. But also there were comments about the plans examiners and how they perform plan review. One was about uh, code sections. Plan review can get lengthy, certain items. We do actually provide code sections, but usually we do that on critical life safety items. For instance, if you had a firewall that was required, that's, that's really something that we would uh, quote the section and tell you about it and how to build that. But we can do that on all code items in the future. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, we've also created a comment letter, a template, that will be consistent. So all comments will go on the same template letter, and then that will be issued to all applicants whenever they receive their comments for plan review. Again, electronic plan review is something that we're working on to uh, expand the use. We use a Bluebeam software. It's a standard uh, developing SOP, but uh, one of the challenges we have as we're working on is the upload and download capabilities of large files. And again, I've listed the DSSR, that's a long-term solution. Currently, that's underway. Number six, there's an opportunity to explore expedited processes. That is about uh, plan review and getting an expedited plan review. So what we would like to do, and we've already started the process, is have a third party perform that expedited plan review. And the reason we would do that is because that would allow our plans examiners to keep working on projects that don't have expedited uh, requested. So they're able to keep working on projects and then third party would perform the expedited plan review. We've already created that document and it is an RFQ in process with purchasing. We would probably have to adjust the fee schedule, uh, amend it to reflect the plan review requirements for the fees on expedited plan review. Number seven, explore field functionality options. This is about our inspectors and their capabilities with their iPads in the field. So what, what the inspectors can do is certainly they go with the addresses and the permit numbers and they can go out there to the field and record the uh, inspection results and send that to the contractors. So that's immediate, but they are not able to look at the history, which can be helpful, and they can't look at plans electronically. So we are suggesting a use of a VPN, a virtual protection network, which would access the TrackIt desktop software, and then they will be able to look at that information. I've actually been able to do that on iPad, my iPad, so I know that it works. We just need to expand that. Technology Services is exploring this option. One of the things that we also, uh, in looking at this, in June, uh, Internet Explorer, which is what we use TrackIt with, and it has to be used on that browser, will be uh, going away. So we are testing Edge, which is the new browser that will be replacing Internet Explorer, and that's already going on, and from what we understand, it's working out very well, so that'll be expanded uh, very soon. Number eight, expand application guidelines and checklists. So we do have a lot of information on the website about what we do. And so we have updated and expanded several things as part of this exercise. A lot of informational handouts out there on permitting. One of the things we were asked is what to expect after a permit is submitted. Well, we didn't have anything like that. So we do now. And that is one of the things that handouts that we have created. And so we've tried to fill all the different stakeholder our requests, and so our website has a lot more information and updated. This is certainly something uh, that is just a blush of some of the uh, handouts and uh, work processes that we have, certainly not something you can read, but in so doing the exercise, staff has really embraced looking at a lot of different things. For instance, uh, generators. As a result of Winter Storm Uri, we have seen an uptick in residential generator requests. And so we've streamlined that process. It's one page 
we have that here uh, shown. You can't read it, but we've uh, collapsed a lot of the things that we were working on, made it a lot easier to get a generator. Number nine, explore opportunities to consolidate steps in our permit submittal review and inspection process. Well, that is all the things that we have been talking about, all the different steps we've taken through inspections, through uh, uh, the website, and the uh, online portal for uh, development for electronic plan submittal. Uh, one of the things that we also do is for paying. When we know that a permit is ready, we can call the customer and send them an Intel pay, pay link so they can pay online through that link and it will not impact our department as far as the service fees with the credit card. We can also email the permits out, smaller permits, not uh, something as large as uh, uh, an ATB, obviously we couldn't do that. And uh, so we have a lot of things that we have been putting together and working on. And of course, I, I can't fail to mention one more time that Development Services Solution, DSSR, because that is something that we know is, is uh, really going to help us with efficiencies on all the things that we're talking about here. Number 10, consider an additional plans examiner resource. As we talked about one of the things on permit intake, we would like a plans examiner, if, if they could uh, do this, it would be reviewing the commercial and residential projects for intake completeness. They would perform that exercise. They would also do, we would assign them plan review projects, smaller home projects, and we would have them at the front counter answering residential and commercial permitting questions. We also have a plans examiner of the day that takes in uh, calls, so we would ask them to take on that task as well. And we do have a certificate of occupancy permits that we work with uh, planning. So we have to route that. So there's a lot of follow-up on that and some review that takes place. So if we could have a plans examiner as a resource performing all of these duties uh, separately, then that would free up all our plans examiners in the back to continuously work on their projects without any interruption. And so that would be an efficiency that we think would be great. That is something as uh, we approach uh, getting ready for budget that uh, I will be asking for in the future. And at, at this point, if you have any questions, I'm certainly open for questions. Mayor Brooklyn. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate y'all um, looking at your department and seeing how we can better serve our community. I have two questions. On the expedited review process that you're looking at, uh, do you think that there will be a limited number who can utilize this at a time before we get backed up and it's no longer expedited? That's an excellent question. And we had experience with that uh, many years ago. Um, laying out all my cards on the table. We did this a long time ago, and that's exactly what happened. Everyone wanted it. And so they were all on the table, and we didn't have an expedited plan review. So we raised the fee, and it, it did have an impact, so that got smaller. But uh, we limited that to a smaller scope of 5,000 square foot and business occupancy, which is basically an office. So right now, what we would like to do is have it for uh, interior finish outs, uh, 10,000 square feet, or 50 sprinkler heads now. In the stakeholder input, they commented on the fire department, and they had this in place. So I talked to fire, and that is exactly the scope of what they have for their expedited plan review. So it's a match, and so that's the, the, the reason that, uh, that we would do that. So I think it's possible that we can certainly expand the program if we need to, but we need to see what the response would be. Thank you. My second question is, do you have a plan for following up with the community and our stakeholders after all this is implemented to see um, what their thoughts are and how this has impacted their business? I thought about that because um, all the stakeholders were anonymous, so I would have loved to talk to them about a lot of these things. Uh, we don't have that luxury. But what we do have coming out of COVID 
is something that we meant to implement in uh, March, uh, but as we keep moving around, are we okay, are we not, I think we're at a good point where we will begin uh, uh, contractor luncheons again. And I would, uh, what I would like to do is, uh, if I can, certainly I can ask, is the consultant could give me the list of all the stakeholders we had and invite them to the luncheon. Certainly we can talk about the different things and uh, uh, we'll also invite all the builders. And so we used to do that at, at least three times a year. Uh, and so we used to get a lot of feedback on that. And that's one of the things that I think would help us. Uh, it's also something we've been missing for the last two years. Council Member Grady. Thank you, Mr. Mata. Just a couple of questions uh, for you. First, um, you indicated that um, you're working with TrackIt on Edge or, or moving it uh, from IE to Edge and working with it on iPads. And then you also mentioned the new system DSSR uh, that you're moving to and eventually you're going to be moving away from TrackIt. Why are we testing DSSR on Edge and on iPads? Because if you're going to be moving towards that, it doesn't seem to be practical to be spending time figuring out if TrackIt would work on Edge. The DSSR is uh, a completely new software. We don't even know what it is at this point since we just had the RFP go out uh, last month. And so uh, um, from my understanding, we have a very aggressive schedule. It, uh, we expect to have a selection completed by the end of the summer in August. Uh, possibly the entire new software, whatever is selected, uh, I would think implemented at this time next year, we'd hopefully be using it. So everything that you're asking would be in the one source of that software. I don't know what that software is, but I would hope that it would, uh, it would work uh, with, uh, with everything that we're doing, all the workarounds with track it. It's also, but in the spec that we drew for that, the specification that we put together for DSSR, it would include working with Microsoft Edge, correct? Uh, it includes working with all uh, web browsers or anything that it is, it is certainly going to pick that up. I'm sorry I didn't get to that more succinctly. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, and that's one of the reasons. So DSSR is not a defined system as yet. DSSR no. is a request of, of an RFP it, and you have no idea. It's, it, I'm sorry, it's, it's Development Services Software Replacement DSSR. All right. That's what we, we call it. Okay. It's a, it's a, I hate to say it, inside joke. We're supposed to call it the DSSR. We're not supposed to say that we're replacing track it. We're not supposed yeah. to say that. Okay. Um, second question. Um, one of the things that I hear from builders and developers is on-site inspections and timeliness of on-site inspections. And also, uh, at, um, from their position, one inspector will say, um, uh, certain things need to be met in order to receive a, a certificate. Um, a second inspector will come out and say different things in order to reach a, uh, a certificate of occupancy or whatever it is. There seems to be some disconnect on the site. So as you are talking with stakeholders, did they voice that? And, and I was looking in all of the items that you had, and I didn't see how that was being addressed. That's something we hear uh, all the time. It is a struggle. And uh, right now we have uh, two new inspectors. Uh, they're quite seasoned, uh, more than 20 years of experience. Uh, they joined us in the last uh, three months. Um, so just uh, getting together on all the things that we do as far as looking at the codes and how we apply them that is a consistency thing we work on. Uh, we have meetings uh, right now scheduled out through the year on training. We have a lot of things that we uh, have every Monday with a, a review of a, a meeting on where inspectors are, plans examiners, everything that we want to do, I'll be on the same page. I frequently hear this as a comment. Uh, Sometimes it's something that is just explained from where uh, there's a code item that was misunderstood and it's exactly the same thing that they said. They simply didn't understand the message in the field. But we're working on that 
consistency is something that is hard to achieve, but we're always in pursuit of that. Okay, because that 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 seems to be the one of the the larger hangups that I hear um, within the community of developers, and the issue um, sometimes is costly because they may see that they need to do something an adjustment um, to what the final product is. They spend dollars to do that. And then the next inspection either says, oh, you really didn't have to do that, or now you need to do something else. And then they, it's more dollars. So that's the concern that I hear. And if we're looking at that and addressing it, I think that's okay. Yes, sir. Uh, we certainly want to address that. And uh, I, I would welcome any builder to call me on anything that's ever in, a, in, that, in that area, because we always want to understand and make sure we're, we're doing the right thing. Let me get to Council, Councilwoman Homer. Uh, yes, I'm, I've heard the same comments, um, Councilmember Grady, so thank you for bringing that up. I did reach out to a few people for input that are stakeholders, and every one of them had very good things to say about you, Mr. Mata. So you're, you're, you have a lot of people's respect that even though maybe things don't go smoothly, they had very good things to say about you. Um, so in addition to that concern with the have not having the consistency. I also heard a few people say that they'll come out to pass me, me for my CO and something's wrong and so they'll fail it but not continue the walkthrough so that they can get through all of the items so that they can try to get them all fixed at once. So I don't know how, how often that happens but I'm just sharing that, that input. Um, I also heard some very positive comments from people who have been pleased with recent improvements, which I'm not sure if they're the result of COVID, um, but people telling me that they're able to pay online, and now it sounds like there's only certain situations where you can do that. Is it correct that once you replace E-Track, or sorry, once you find your DSSR, <laughs> then that will have the ability to, to make all payments? Is that the plan, so? Yes, ma'am, that is exactly the goal. And that's okay. what we're going to, that's where we're going to get. Okay. And then also, um, I, I'm excited to hear about this technology where you'll be able to upload more documents and share more information. Um, I also heard that recent improvements, uh, texting, email, and cell phone access to inspectors has been great. And I don't know if that's a new thing or because of the pandemic, but it's been appreciated. So thank you. Um, and if you can continue doing that, people do appreciate it. Um, I was gonna ask how can we support your department with any additional technology, but it sounds like you're giving us the direction you're going, and it sounds like a good direction. Um, we've had to pivot and make a lot of changes during the pandemic, um, and are there any things that we can continue looking at, such as maybe the possibility of virtual inspections for certain less technical items, or even taking photographs to send in to speed up the process, maybe especially stakeholders that you have a long relationship with and have earned your trust and I don't know if that's something that you've considered as well. We actually did that during the pandemic. That was something we had to do, especially a lot with homeowners. Did a lot of digital inspections and uh, we could, uh, we testing software. Uh, there's different softwares out there uh, that function exactly like FaceTime. And so you could see everything uh, actual and we could, uh, we would actually still drive out there we would be in the truck and uh, they wouldn't let us in, which is fine, but the contractor would be around there or the homeowner and show us exactly what we needed to see. And we could uh, talk to them through through the inspection. So we that's something that we also want to be able to do with the uh, DSSR. We don't want to leave that because that was very helpful, especially through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think as we've all come back, uh, that's not been a request as much because we're getting back to normal. But uh, we want to keep doing that. Well, gas prices are going up too, well, so we to save a little bit there. And then the last um, um, comment that I received was just streamlining processes. A lot of times there's a place for our applicant and the contractor, and sometimes it's the same person. So just like when you buy something on Amazon and you put your mailing address for billing, you can check the same as applicant or something so they don't have to enter information numerous times. But I don't know, maybe uh, that'll happen on the On new. the application, you're saying? Mm -hmm. It might be the same person. Yeah, we, we've got, uh, um, I believe all of our applications are online, are fillable with uh, the PDF. So you could actually, oh, I see what you're saying. You have to type it every single time. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. 
So just a box that says same as yeah, applicant certainly. or something like that, that would save it's some time. a good time. idea. We'll do that. So anyway, but again, I mean, I've heard, heard very good things about you, so it's nice. Thank you for the presentation. Councilman Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I was also kind of following up on what the Councilman Holder just said, that uh, in my dealings in my business are, are primarily with, with residential contractors, builders, improvers, things like that. And, and I just want to say that the people that I talk with generally would much rather be doing business here in Plano and dealing with our staff than, than some of the other areas that I won't name. But but I, overall, we're, I'm sure we're not perfect, no one is, but but I think from what I hear, we are doing a really good job. The one, the one thing I like is hearing that uh, we're trying to go more field, on, you know, in hand, you know, electronic communication uh, inspections because that could eliminate some of the things that we were concerned about is where maybe one inspector might have said something and, and told someone something verbally, uh, and then another one comes out and says something different. If it's done electronically, you can check it, put your notes in electronically, it's part of the record. Somebody else comes out, they can go, and they see the same conversation, same record that was done previously, and that could you know, alleviate some of those, uh, those problems. So I think, I think that's great. So I think the, the new, the DSSR, uh, working toward that, uh, hopefully will solve some of these issues. The, the, the last thing, the one thing I really want to ask you about, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, e-track uh, that we're using, that, that's both for residential customers as well as commercial? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, and again, maybe once we get electronic, that's, that will help. But, uh, but I know I was just speaking with a resident last week that was telling me about issues they were having with the building permit process and, and they never mentioned e-track and the thing they were talking about is they, they would get conflicting information and it was hard for them to, to find out they'd have to call up or email or something like that to find out. So, so for me, they didn't know about the, uh, you know, the e-track it. So that, and that could have just been, you know, an, an anomaly, something unusual, but uh, I don't know if there's a better way to be certain that that gets passed out to, you know, to every applicant so they know and they can go in and track things electronically. Perhaps when we get an application, it'll be something that's automatic since we can do it as a link, we can respond and send it right to them. So everybody that we, we have a permit with, no matter who it is, residential or commercial, they can receive that and know about each track it, and that's good. that's what we need to do. Yeah, and I think the checklist thing that you're talking about giving it is very good because that was one of the other comments is that they weren't exactly you know sure what they needed you know to to provide back, and this was kind of a usual situation. I don't want to get into all the details, but but uh, I think so some of the things you're saying are will end up helping correct uh, situations like that. Uh, but if we could be sure that that e tracking info is definitely given out to everybody, that I think that's going to be a big plus as well. Certainly, we can do that. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Celso, for that great presentation and for the important work uh, uh, that you and your whole department does. Uh, I really appreciate how you guys are uh, relentlessly focusing on process improvements and, you know, not, not resting on your laurels, but, you know, really looking at, at things that can be uh, done differently to create additional efficiency. Uh, I also really like the, uh, the expedited uh, idea you know, and using that as a potential source of additional revenue. Um, and uh, uh, toward that end, I, I want, I, I can't recall uh, uh, what percentage on average uh, do we recover costs in general uh, during the uh, uh, permit review process? Well, um, the quick answer is I don't know what that actual number would be because each of the projects would be uh, separate in nature, gotcha. uh, varying degrees of, uh, we have a uh, evaluation process on permits, and then we have set fees on smaller permits. So overall, I would I would it'd certainly be a guess, but I think that we're certainly uh, close to um, could be more than seventy five percent a lot okay, of times. And uh, our our permit fees and and the way we uh, look at uh, the department, uh, we certainly uh, there was a pent up demand after COVID. So 2021 was a pretty good year for us because we exceeded the projections that we had. Uh, that they were well over eight million, mm -hmm. and we were thinking it was going to be like four. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, we were extremely high. So it's hard to gauge that, but I know that was a surprise. Well, thank you for that information. And uh, I haven't uh, haven't looked at the the fee schedule recently. Could you remind me? Do we ever uh, base the fees on the value of the project? Uh, you know, like a larger project, we have a, a higher fee. 
Yes, we have a fee schedule that bases it in several different levels. Uh, but um, as it breaks out, it goes by the thousands. And as you go forward, it, if it reaches over, I believe it's over 500,000, could be wrong on that, but it's $5.25 per thousand dollar valuation. And then it goes over, if it goes over that. Well, th thank you, Celso. And so then wh where I was going with that is you were mentioning the need for an additional um, plans examiner. And, and it sounded like there was so much interest in the expedited uh, process when we offered that that perhaps if, um, you know, perhaps if that were, were something that were, were widely used, we might be able to recover even more costs and, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps the cost of, of a plans examiner would be covered, um, you know, just through uh, expedited fees. I don't know if that's possible, but just wanted to, you know, put that out there as an idea. Cost recovery obviously always is, a, you know, a great thing when we can do that. So, so anyway, thank you for, uh, for the great work you're doing. The good news is the budget season is upon us, and so we have plenty of opportunity to have the discussion about fee, fee schedules, and staff members to make sure we support this. But Mayor and Council, this, is, this was a huge study, a huge undertaking by the Building Inspections Department, and I really appreciated the fact that even prior to coming back to Council, the Celso and his staff have fully embraced the consultant recommendations and started putting these into action. So all the, the bullet points that were in blue we're already in process or have been implemented. And I, I commend Celso and his team because in discussing it with him, uh, the statement was, if we can do better, we're going to do better. And they've uh, adopted this. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank Celso and his team for embracing something to make sure we're always trying to uh, uh, respond to the needs of the community. So thank you. Thank you, Celso. Appreciate all your work. Thank you. Our next item is discussion direction uh, regarding comments of public interest policy. Mayor and Council, as you're well aware, uh, we have a section in our regular agenda each and every Council meeting that allows comments of public interest from our citizens. It's been a long practice of the city to uh, employ the best possible democratic processes uh, to allow our citizens to give feedback to the, to the Council on items that are not posted for uh, the agenda for that hearing that night. Uh, we have had this in place uh, for a number of years prior to uh, some electronic um, advances that we've seen with both email, texting, and other ways that citizens are able to um, communicate with our council members. We've also had a number of um, situations where uh, we've had uh, the comments of public interest have some um, some coverage lately, and one of the items that we wanted to bring back to you was a review of this uh, comments about public interest based upon the council putting this on the agenda at our last session. So with that, uh, we're happy to answer any questions. I think I think what what we're looking for is to make sure that we're constantly transparent and and give our citizens the opportunity to to come before us with concerns that affect the city and the the city can can actually make a difference and uh, that's that's our objective to make sure that uh, the comments that we get are comments that we can actually affect so um, we we want to do that but we also want to avoid uh, those issues that really don't, uh, we don't have anything to do with. And so that, that's been an occurrence over the last three um, council meetings. And we're, we're just open to hearing ideas that, that uh, we can assure that our citizens that want to speak on behalf of, of an issue that, that affects the city, uh, that we can, can hear and, and try to avoid uh, the issues that don't uh, have anything to do with the business meeting at hand. Mr. Mayor, I, I have a few comments and I, I have really strong opinions about everything in life, but um, specifically this one. I, um, I, I find it um, that when we allow public comments, it's great exercise of um, our constitutional rights. However, I think um, Plano has been known for many years as a city of inclusiveness rather than exclusiveness. And when comments are meant to harm the city's image as well as some of our residents, 
Um, I, I think that's where we need to draw the line and we need to actually do something about it. Um, if the public comments is raised because there is a genuine concern of City of Plano, I have no problem listening to crit, uh, critical critiques um, or, or comments that um, are negative or positive one way or the other. I, I do have a problem when um, City of Plano, our beloved city, is being put in the spotlight for um, something that has nothing to do with our continuing strive to be the city of excellence. I ask that um, all of our council members um, together consider possibly um, making this public comment section to be something that is um, more focused on city business, more focused on you know the the protocol that is necessary to make um, our um, our city council meeting um, appropriate, um, whether it's through clothing, whether it's through um, the verbiage that's used, whether or not it's um, anything that would show the reason why we are here today and the reason why we believe that city of Plano is a city of excellence. So um, I am proposing that we, we think about possibly um, some of the different things that we can do uh, for example, consolidate the public comments to perhaps once a month or um, and then have a separate section where we could call the um, public comments where it's um, it can be focused and we can all you know take parts in it without making it into a show. Um, those are some of my recommendations. Councilman Grady. Well, I, I wanted to be uh, part of the conversation because I seconded the motion that we put this on the discussion uh, item. Um, and as gingerly as I can walking through this discussion, um, I, I think that, uh, I, and I totally agree with um, Deputy Mayor too, that the discussion needs to be relevant to the city and the discussion um, and the comments from our citizens um, are things that we need to know about our city that we need to we need to review or look at or um, make adjustments to um, the as I call it <clears throat> comic relief um, and the use of a dais for that purpose is just really out of the box. Um, and uh, I find it extreme as an extreme issue to me. Um, so I am all for uh, putting a, um, a, a decision together or a thought together that we gather the public comments into a specially called meeting. Um, we have it somewhere where it makes logical sense um, within the, uh, the course of business during the day. Um, and we can determine um, the relevancy of the comments to the city. Um, citizens that come forward need to be heard. Um, and we don't want to get into the point where we're really stepping on anybody's First Amendment rights. Um, but there comes a time where there's a distinction between First Amendment rights and trying to push the boundaries of that beyond the scope of what we really can act on and do, um, and what we face as a, you know, a relevant subject to the city. So um, as we start our discussion and thinking about this, I'm, I'm really um, for putting something together where we are stacking this into a, a different form um, and making it much more relevant to city business um, so that we can do the things that we need to do in order to respond to our citizens and not a national network. Shelby, did you have something? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Sure. Um, I think anybody knows how ardently I defend the First Amendment, and we have an obligation to um, hear our constituents. We don't have an obligation to provide somebody a platform for entertainment. And I think the fact that even though we're not legally required to, the fact that we offer an open comment to public interest every meeting is a great thing and speaks to the transparency of the city of Plano. 
Um, <clears throat> I could get behind limiting um, the, the discussion content to anything the city of Plano government can actually do anything about, um, uh, as well as potentially having a special session. I'd want no less frequently than monthly because I think the fact that citizens can come speak every couple of weeks um, is important, but I could consider both of those. I'm afraid that um, uh, any, any restrictions beyond that might be a declaration of game on and uh, the people who are abusing our council meetings may be motivated to go full steam ahead. Thank you. Councilman Riccadillo. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I agree with uh, many of the comments that have been made so far. Uh, I know that we're all ardent supporters of free speech as we should be. Um, meanwhile, the purpose of a city council meeting is to do city business. So I think it makes logical sense to limit comments to those that are germane to city business. Um, I also think uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem 2's uh, suggestion about decorum and, and address code uh, makes sense. You know, I think at a minimum that would include uh, no costumes and no swimwear. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, uh, that's not asking, asking much. I mean, I think to, you know, to, to dine in uh, most establishments in our city, you would have to, to wear, uh, uh, you know, shoes and a, a shirt. And, you know, I, I think we can expect that for a council meeting as well. Um, I'm open to considering a special meeting, but I would, I would really suggest that we start with those two simple changes and consider uh, uh, other potentially more significant changes to format in the future if needed. I also uh, feel strongly that we should keep uh, comments of public interest each meeting. I understand the desire to move to monthly, but we do have a number of citizens who are genuinely interested in addressing the city council on, on issues of city business. And I think it would, I think it would uh, be in our best interest to continue the, the practice of uh, comments of, of public interest every meeting. Uh, so anyway, that's my, uh, my, my two cents. Thanks, appreciate it. Guys have anything? Um, regardless with what direction we go, I just want to make sure the citizens know that we are available by email at any time. You can call us. We do get a lot of emails, so if you don't get a, a response promptly, you know, I, at least for myself, I'll, I'll say you feel free to send another one just to make sure I got it. Um, but we are accessible and we are here to hear from you um, outside of the city council meetings as well. Councilman Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to start with saying, I, I don't think that we should allow the city and, and this body to be hijacked by the juvenile actions of someone who decides to come here and rather than talk about serious business, business that affects the lives and uh, just the living, the standards of the residents of the city of Plano to, to affect what we do. Uh, if, if we react, change the process that, that we've done for years because of something like this, what's the next step? Uh, so I just think, let this play its course. It, this is not representative of us as a body or as a city. It's purely when someone comes and puts an act on, it's on them has nothing that is not reflecting on our city, on the professionalism of our city, or the good thing that we do. But if we react to it, it is affecting the city and what we do. We're showing that it does. So I would say, let them come. They want to come waste their time. Hey, I'm, I'm here. I'll, I'll give them three minutes and I'll listen to them. But they're the ones that are going to be foolish, not us. So I just want to throw that out there. I think of all the things that I've heard, Doing, if we want to do anything, I'd say, you know, doing the once a month where we do a special call session, still allow our citizens to come and talk, that's good. But, but I just, I'm a firm believer. I don't think we should, again, I use the word hijack. We should not change the way that we've done business forever as a result of somebody else making a fool out of themselves at our expense. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I agree with several comments of my fellow council members. I I do, do agree, I tend not to be a person that likes to just react to situations. I, I prefer that we be strategic and decide what's best for our council. Um, I, I will say out of everything that I've heard, um, 
I probably agree most with the course that um, Council Member Riccadelli put forward of let's limit it to um, items that as city business and then let's put some direction on um, dress code decorum. Um, at this point, I'm not supportive of doing a special meeting. I think, um, I, I think that we should just make these small steps first and see how that impacts us. That's what I'd be supportive of. Okay, thank you. I, I, I think to, uh, we'll put this on the agenda next, next meeting with these suggestions and we'll come up with a, a solution council-wide. Well, real, real quick for clarification, just to make sure I'm getting it right. I think that there was consensus, not unanimous, but for the special called meeting um, before on a monthly basis to allow any citizen to come address the council. I think I heard at least uh, a consensus to, to go that, that route. I know there were some preferences otherwise. But um, the protocols for decorum, including dress, and then city business. So that's what I heard, and I, I want to make sure I'm kind of seeing head nods that that's what we, what we discussed. So I'm seeing some say no, and so, uh, again, for clarification, I want to make sure that, that we're getting this right as we bring this back so that this doesn't become a prolonged discussion. I'm not in support of the special called meeting. And same here, just to be clear. Okay. Yeah, and I'm going to say that I am in support of it, but I'm in support of it from this standpoint, that it, the special called meeting could be every other week. And it uh, simply yeah. is moving right. It simply is moving the public comments from where they are today to a different portion within the meeting. And that's really all it's saying. It isn't, it's simply defining the, the content of the meeting and how the meeting will be conducted rather than moving it to a monthly meeting, leave it every other week like we have today, but simply move it within the structure of the agenda. That's, that's where I'm at. I agree with that. I agree with that too. Um, so the hold on yeah Shelby go ahead um, <clears throat> I would actually like to um, try out uh, Councilman Smith's recommendation of letting this play out before we move things to a special meeting but I would be supportive of that if need be okay okay council so I, I don't have consensus <laughs> so um, would y'all like to discuss further, think further? Because at this point, without consensus, because the, the special meetings, and this was, I think, an important aspect, special meetings do not have to be recorded. So they do not have to be uh, televised. So that was one of the elements that- we, uh, we do have consensus that we wanted to focus on city business, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. I think we all agree on that. Yeah, I would now question. Yeah. Judy, where did you stand on that? I'm sorry. Yes, I agree with what Casey just said. I, I kind of am with Rick on letting this play out and seeing and then reevaluating. Okay. All right. And, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm fine with, with let's, let's narrow it to, to the scope because it is fairly broad. Basically, come here and talk about tiddlywinks if you want to. That uh, let's make it something narrowed down to where it affects city business and not just you know, any topic in the world. And, and I'd like it also to be a requirement that whoever comes to speak is a stakeholder in the city of Plano. Can I do that? A resident or a... No. Well, it Actually, has to be relevant any, to city. Any, anybody that's doing business in the city yeah, that, or has, it, a has, stakeholder. has an impact or possible business, it, that's a pretty wide yeah. Yeah, stretch a, to be able to... big net, but... Yeah, I, I'm not willing to limit it. Okay. I think... I, think I would... I would actually qualify that to say anybody who has a concern about something to do with the city government that might not be a resident, but they have uh, they have some they are impacted in some way and have a concern. But it has to do with city business. Okay. All right, council. So city business and protocol for appropriate clothing is what's on the list. Yeah. Got what it. about? Um, I'm sorry. What, <laughs> what about the um, the whether is every meeting or is it? Are we still doing every for, meeting? For city business and clothing, it would be, otherwise it would be staying the same. Yeah. Okay. And I think we might need to remind other rules that we have. This brought to my attention. I didn't realize you're not allowed to have signs. Is that right? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. okay. Uh, consent and regular agendas. Any item a council member would like to remove? <clears throat> Uh, item D, Mr. Mayor. 
Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, item six, council items for discussion and future agendas. Yes, Mayor, I actually have three items. Go ahead. Uh, the first, and though we may have plans for this, uh, if necessary, I'd like to bring up Shannon the results of the listening tour that we just reviewed uh, with our residents in a variety of mediums rather than just the council preliminary open meeting. Councilman, that doesn't need to be an agenda item. We can just share that publicly. Okay. Great. Second one. Um, I'd like to bring up uh, a discussion of what we can and as a council, um, uh, what we should be um, uh, restricted by in um, promoting support and awareness of the war in Ukraine. Uh, obviously, that would require a specific uh, guardrails. I would like to bring that up for discussion by council. This might be as simple as um, <clears throat> listing reputable, uh, uh, reputable organizations that people can pursue. Well, I, I mean, I have seen a lot of cities, churches, different organizations that have been publicly showing their support. And I think that's what Shelby's getting at. We were at a rally last Saturday where people were there to show their support. So I think just maybe finding out what ways we can tell people that they can support, put them in touch with reputable organizations, maybe something we do through communications, maybe it doesn't need to be on the agenda, but I, I, I agree with Shelby that we're seeing an outpouring of support, and I feel like the city of Plano should show theirs as well. Yeah, and this is personal for me, as I have family in Russia and friends in Ukraine. Okay. And the third one? Uh, the third, and I've spoken with a couple of you about this, I'd like to explore uh, effectively uh, ramping up, beefing up the Volunteer in Plano program uh, in order to identify where we might um, create a, uh, a world-class volunteer organization out of what is already a great volunteer organization so that we can offset the uh, current inflationary environment. We know that this is going to hit uh, the cost of city services, the inflation is, uh, but it's also going to hit our residents, and I'd like to explore ways by leveraging volunteers to not have to hit our uh, citizens with uh, property tax increase on top of inflation. And I'd like to discuss that uh, at the retreat that we have later this month. I'll second uh, uh, discussion of, of uh, uh, leveraging volunteers even more so in our city efforts, maybe something along the lines of what CAP does for the police department, uh, you know, for other departments as well. And we'll do that at the retreat. Absolutely. I think that's great. I, I was just uh, seconding okay. the agenda. Thank All you, right. Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a recess and return at 7 o'clock, which is only about two minutes away.
I now declare that the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. Councilman Williams is on Zoom. We will begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Senior Pastor Chris Dowd with Christ United Methodist Church and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge led by Girl Scout Senior Troop 3460 with Clark High School. Would you please rise? Let us pray. God of us all, in these anxious times with conflict abroad and challenges at home, we give you thanks for those who are called to elected leadership, fellow citizens who are willing to serve in the public eye and to work for the good of the city. We pray, God, that as we live together in the blessings of community, that you would deliver us all from selfish personal agendas, that you would help us rise above petty partisanship, and that you would guide us in our relationships with you and with each other. We ask God that you would bless these leaders and their families, guide John, Casey, Maria, Anthony, Rick, Shelby, Julie, and Rick, giving them your wisdom and discernment as they make decisions for Plano. We ask that you would bless the people of our city and that you would lead us by your grace to live lives pleasing to you. In all these things, gracious and loving God, we offer you our thanks, our praise, and our devotion. Amen. Join us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the Texas State Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Please be seated. Come over here. Come over here. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank Thank you for doing Thank this. You. Appreciate it. Today, uh, we're, we're honoring National Volunteer Week. I'd like to call down Karina Sadler with the Volunteer Resources Supervisor. Every year, the City of Plano volunteers donate countless hours to help our community wherever needed. And these volunteers gladly help in our area without expecting anything in return. So with that being said, I'd like to uh, present this proclamation 
Whereas Volunteers in Plano engages volunteers representing the rich diversity of our city of Plano, from scouts to older adults and from lifelong residents to new, new arrivals, all who participate in the service to better our community. And whereas volunteers enhance services provided to the city of Plano residents and extend capacity of the city departments. 6,354 dedicated volunteers served 53,500 hours with the city of Plano in 2021. Volunteers have strengthened our community and become the driving force for volunteers in Plano to remain a model municipal volunteer program across the country. Now, therefore, I, John B. Munns, mayor of the city of Plano, do hereby proclaim April 17th through the 23rd, 2022, a National Volunteer Week in Plano. I also extend special recognition to all City of Plano volunteers and do hereby encourage citizens to join me and the Plano City Council in honoring the thanking all who volunteer, especially our City of Excellence. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Okay, our first item, comments of public interest. We're gonna to move to uh, after item, individual items at the end of the uh, meeting. So we'll move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Motion to approve the, key, uh, the consent agenda except for item D as in Delta. Second. Thank you. I have a motion, a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item D. Please vote. Motion passes. How do you, how do you vote, Shelby? Yes. Okay, motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Item D. Item D. I don't know if I'm my job. Here we go. To approve the terms and conditions of a third amendment to a license agreement by and between the city of Plano, Texas and AT&T Corp a New York corporation and authorizing its execution by the city manager and providing an effective date. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, thank you. So I pulled this off of the consent agenda because the uh, price escalator in here with the automatic renewals every 10 years is only 3% every 10 years. And importantly, if I'm understanding correctly, that's not 3% uh, per year. It's 3% total for 10 years meaning that it's, you know, about 0.3% every year um, or really slightly less than that because, you know, it compounds. So it's probably a quarter of a percent to get to, to 3% over um, 10 years. Given the high inflation environment that we find ourselves in, I think the last number I saw, and this may be old, but was something like 7.5%. So being more in, in the range of 0.3% of is so far below inflation and really below inflation even in a low inflation environment that uh, over time, uh, you, you know, that will build in just a bigger and bigger discount to this. And obviously revenue that we don't recover through this contract, you know, being a fair price is revenue that has to be borne by taxpayers through property taxes or sales taxes. So I think that uh, I, I'm going to move to table this item and that we uh, take a look at the, the price escalator in here. And uh, I understand that there's an existing city policy regarding the 3% uh, um, price escalator for, for every 10 years. So 
Um, I'd like to, uh, to have that discussion together on a future agenda, uh, looking at that policy because um, in, uh, particularly in the inflationary environment that we're in, um, that's just going to, to turn this into a sweetheart deal over time. And uh, um, especially when we're locking ourselves into, into 30 years because there are automatic renewals after 10 years and 20 years, I think we need to take a, a, a careful look at that. So um, I, I would uh, move to table this item and look at the price escalator uh, on a future agenda. Councilman, we're only ta we're only uh, agendized to talk about this specific oh, item. Oh, I'm sorry. Policy I'm sorry. Decision well, well then I'll, I'll just move to a table item D to a, a future agenda where we can look at the price escalator on this contract. I'll second that. I have a motion a second to table uh, item D. Uh, I have, is, hold on. Uh, uh, is there any discussion from staff regarding this or the Andrew, would you like to chime in? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, with this agreement, uh, it is based off of a price schedule that was adopted by this body a number of years ago. Um, we're happy to poll other cities and see uh, if it's time to update that and if uh, our practices are still in line with what is pretty standard across the industry. So if you'd like to allow staff the opportunity to conduct that analysis, we could bring those results back to you at a future meeting, and then we could decide if action needed to be taken at that point. I was just going to ask if there's any time sensitivity to this. So we have been in uh, negotiations with AT&T on this item. Again, we standardize this across all of our agreements. So um, if there is a desire to make a change, I would uh, uh, have you all consider that this would also impact future agreements um, with other companies as well. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we do have some time available, certainly between now and the next meeting, uh, that won't impact negotiations. Any other comments from council? I have a motion and a second to table item D in the consent agenda. Please vote. Shelby? Yes. Okay. Motion passes eight to zero to table. Next item in items and in individual consideration. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, the length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2022-2 to waive the 300 foot distance separation from arcade use to the residential zoning district to the south and amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amending. Granting specific use permit number 61 for arcade on 0.1 acre of land located 390 feet east of Custer Road and 810 feet south of Parker Road in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas. Presently zoned plan development 90 retail. Directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city and providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Executives. I'm Christina Day, Director of Planning. I'm here to present Zoning Case 2022-2 to you this evening, and it is a request for a specific use permit for an arcade. So this is at the southeast corner of Custer and Parker in a lease space in an existing shopping center. You can see the notice boundaries um, on and the zoning on the zoning map uh, on the exhibit before you. 
The next exhibit shows an aerial view of the shopping center that also designates the lease space. Um, and so you can see it is a relatively small area within the existing shopping center. With regard to the comprehensive plan, this is a future land use map. And you can see it is within the community corners designation on the future land use map area. It is uh, designated in red. Um, and then it is close to the neighborhood area uh, and designation there to the south. Additionally, we have information on the land use and housing inventory. This is classified as retail. It does conform to the mix of uses within the community corners dashboard. It will not impact the mix of uses, nor does it require findings because it's just a transfer of retail to retail. So with that, arcade uses do require separations within the zoning ordinance. So there are separations from religious facilities. That's a 300-foot separation. However, there are no facilities within 300 feet, so not really an issue for this location. Same with public or parochial schools. That's a 1,000-foot separation. But again, uh, there are no facilities within, a thousand, that should say, 1,000 feet. Um, there's a residential separation that's at minimum 300 foot separation. However, the residences are to the, it should be to the front door, the graphic there, um, the front of the shopping center. Um, the distance waiver allows council to waive that distance if, it, if you find as a body that the permit will not be detrimental or injurious to the public health safety or general welfare or otherwise offensive to the neighborhood. So that's the standard we're looking for this evening um, in granting this permit. And the Planning and Zoning Commission did find that this met that standard and is therefore recommending a waiver of the 300 foot distance. So one of the reasons they may have found this standard is the public feedback. We got one letter signed within the 200-foot buffer that was in support. The others, uh, we did not receive responses from other residents uh, within the buffer or uh, from the property itself. We received two total responses on this zoning case from property owners within Plano, both in support. So with that, the Planning and Zoning Commission did vote uh, unanimously with an 8-0 vote to support this and does recommend that council grant the waiver that's required on this specific use permit. With that, I'm available to answer questions you might have on this case. The applicant is here and does have a presentation for you this evening. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Thank you. I'll open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to address the uh, council? Good evening. We are Beth and Sean Reynolds, and we are Control V Virtual Reality Arcade franchisees. Because a virtual reality arcade is a newer concept, we wanted to give you some more information about us so you would understand exactly what it is we're proposing. Control V was founded in 2016 in Waterloo, Canada. Our sole purpose is to accelerate the adoption of and provide public access to emerging immersive technologies at an affordable price with unsurpassed customer service. So how does it work? Each user is given a headset along with a pair of goggles and headphones, along with a microphone to communicate with other users and two handheld controllers. This equipment allows the user to be immersed in a 3D computer simulated environment and interact with that environment in a very seemingly real way. Each user will have access to our extensive game library where they can choose from a variety of different types of experiences. For example, you can cook for a restaurant, you can create your own world and universe, you can even use a bow and arrow to defend your village from an attack, dissect a frog in science class, dance on a moving platform like a superstar, or even roam the earth with dinosaurs. And these are just a few examples of what we have to offer. 
Our location would be at 3000 Custer Road, Suite 250. It would be in the Parkwood Shopping Center, which is located near the intersection of Custer Road and West Parker Road. Our facility would be 3,700 square feet. It would have 13 virtual reality stations, a party room, two washrooms, and we don't serve food or drinks, but we do allow our customers that rent the party room to bring their own food and drinks for their celebration. Our hours of operation are 3.30 to 9.30 p.m., Tuesdays through Fridays, 11 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. on Saturdays, and 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Sundays. Virtual reality gaming is currently a $7 billion industry and is expected to experience continued growth. Currently, there is one virtual reality arcade in Frisco and another one in Allen, Texas. However, this would be the first virtual reality arcade in Plano, and this would be the first Control V franchise located in the state of Texas. Giving back to the community is important to us. We participate in a number of initiatives throughout the year. For example, each year we team up with a charity called Extra Life and run a VR gaming marathon the first weekend of November. 100% of the proceeds from this marathon are donated to the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. We just want to thank you for your consideration, and we look forward to bringing this wonderful opportunity to the city of Plano. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the applicant? Deputy Mayor. Hi. Um, so it, it sounds really exciting, by the way, and I, I would love to come and visit once it's um, up and running. But I wanted to ask, uh, it, it seems like it's targeting uh, for the younger uh, I guess high school students or or adults. It are, we, we target between the ages of eight and thirty-five. We do actually have customers under the age of eight, but we recommend that they be eight or older only because the equipment the, won't the, fit their head quite right, it. and it'll be a little bit harder to wrap their small hands around the controllers. But they they still enjoy it. It's just that they would have a better experience if they were just a little bit older and the equipment fit them better. So the second thing would be, uh, the question that I would have is, uh, are alcohol going to be allowed on, on no. premise? No. And actually, um, we had a chance to tour the Waterloo um, location, mm -hmm. and they said that's never even come up because basically it's children's parties that book the party room. Right. They do have corporate events, but typically when they book a corporate event, the people leave and go off site to continue celebrating somewhere else. So Thank you. You're welcome. Omar. Thank you for the presentation, and thank you for choosing Plano to be the first location in Texas. That's exciting. Um, I applaud your community involvement as well. That's always nice to hear. Um, so you said 3,700 square feet and 13 individual rooms? Is that yeah, Right. So they're stations. They have three uh, foam padded walls and a foam padded floor, and um, so it gives them a, a big playing space. It's 10 feet by 10 feet. And then um, they have a much larger room that's going to be built. That's the party room and then the two um, washrooms, obviously. So. So, so the stations are three walls. So one right? person per station yes. is how it would normally work. And then how large is the party room? I have teenage boys, that's why I'm asking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Future oh, customer, I yeah. Know the square feet of the party I, room. I don't remember the square foot footage yeah. for the party room. Okay. I'm sorry. But probably at least 13. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Okay. Do you have any speakers for this? There are no speakers on All this right. item. You had to sign in. Sign up. Thank you very much. No more, no more comments. I'll uh, leave the comments to the council. Motion to approve. Thank second. You. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve item number one. Please vote. Shelby? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes eight to zero. Next item is item two. I'd like to make a motion. No, no sorry. Okay. Go ahead. I gotta. I gotta open. 
start. You've, and Lisa has to start. <laughs> Item number two, public hearing and consideration of a resolution to authorize a substantial amendment to the 2021-2022 action plan and to amend the City of Plano home ownership value limits for use in lieu of the limits provided by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development when using home investment partnership program funds and providing an effective date. From staff, we're just no, go Mary. We, since we noticed this, we wanted to go ahead and conduct the public hearing. If there was anybody here to speak on this item, All otherwise, right. staff recommends to table until uh, that's, May fifth. That's what I needed. So I'll open the public hearing. There Any are no speakers, speakers on no this speakers item. cards. I'll close the public hearing. Confine the comments to the council. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to table the second individual item for consideration to May 9th. Wasn't second. second. <laughs> Thank you. I have a motion and a second to table agenda item number two. Please vote. Shelby? Yes. Thank you. Motion to table eight to zero. Thank you. Okay. Comments of public interest. Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to one, permit, one minute per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And when you approach the podium, please do not touch the microphone or yell into it. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind uh, all of those speakers. Uh, the City of Plano and the Council take the opportunity to hear from our citizens very seriously. We, all, we always welcome feedback on how we can be better. We take seriously our role as city government and the importance of respecting our citizens' time and taxpayers' resources. We strive to conduct ourselves in excellence and focus our, our agenda on city business. And in return, we ask that those that come before us provide the same level of respect. Tonight, we're, we're, we have seven speakers. Each speaker has one minute. We've had a discussion about this uh, period of our meeting and uh, we will make some uh, decisions about it at our next council meeting. But for tonight, uh, we're going to uh, call you and you have one minute to, uh, to speak. So we'll ask the first person. Devante Peters. Devante Peters. The next speaker is JVT. I'll make this quick, but um, I'm JVT, and I'm here to beg all of you, do not California my Texas. I'm an American, a patriot, and a Toby Keith fan. I'm about as Texan as it gets, and Californians are moving to Texas and ruining everything. I mean, they're teaching gender pronouns in first grade. I mean, why don't we focus on teaching first graders the important things like reading, writing, shooting a gun, uh, I'm going to go all the way to the end because I only have one minute. Um, I mean, there are Californians in disguise like Beto O'Rourke. I mean, this man's real name is Robert, but I call him Bob. And Bob cannot confiscate my weapons, my hunting rifle. And to finish, I will quote one of my professors from my third year of community college. If I described a place where only the richest could afford houses and the poor people were on the street, would you think it was a third world country or San Francisco? And to that, I say, please don't California my Texas. Thank you for your time. Sharon Overall. Okay. 
Recently, you all probably heard of the, whole, of the Senior Living Center where over 100 elderly persons lost their homes because of a cigarette butt. The person should be charged with arson or at the least negligent arson. Imagine that you lost all your belongings and memories because of a smoker. The number four cause of fire in a home is the cigarettes. Every night, Pete Dulcus warns that the throwing of cigarette butts out of the window of a vehicle is the number one cause of wildfires. So instead of giving a litter ticket to those who discard their cigarettes on the streets or sidewalk, they should be charged with attempted arson. All it takes is for the cigarette butt to hit the grass on a piece of paper to ignite a fire. The Plano police should drive around in an unmarked car a few days a month and catch these people. Nine out of 10 people who are dangling the cigarette butt out of the window will immediately throw it out when they are finished. They need to be held responsible for their actions. Littering is not the only crime they are committing. Every discarded cigarette butt is, the, is a potential arson. Thank you. Martha Mason. This book, everybody needs to read it now. I am Martha Mason of the U.S. Army. I operate your nation's missile defense systems, but more importantly, my pronouns are she and her, and I am a woman of color. Hey, quit screaming. <sighs> Lastly, if you care about our democracy, you will sign up. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are cowards. Alexander Stein. Well, listen, I prepared a whole speech, but I just want to say, Mayor Munns, you're a coward. You need to look up the Streisand effect. By you guys limiting free speech, you just proved that we've affected your whole meeting. You guys are such pathetic cowards. You guys are scared of giving people three minutes to talk. And I'm the only reason that Plano's even getting an atten any attention. That, I'm the reason why you guys are trending on Twitter. So you're so dumb, you can't even realize the attention might actually help your campaign. But instead, you're going to push back against it. And we're going to publicly embarrass you, Mayor Munns, worse than you've ever been publicly embarrassed. If there's one skeleton in your closet, I'm going to bring a whole group graveyard up here and I'm going to publicly embarrass each member here except for Anthony. Anthony's pretty okay and honestly Rick's okay too but I'm telling you Julie you're toast. Maria you're toast. Mark you're toast. All you guys publicly are going to get embarrassed in this meeting. I don't care if I got one minute. I don't care if I got three minutes. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to disgrace the city of Plano because let me tell you something. I had some respect for it but our politicians you guys think when you get elected that all of a sudden we work for you. That's not how it works bucko. Y'all work for us Maria. You work for me. That's why you got elected but you two dumb to realize that that's the problem you guys have two brain cells to rub together and now you guys are trying to fight fire with fire you're toast mayor much you're toast you're done i'm going to publicly embarrass you worse than you've ever been embarrassed in your whole entire life i hope you haven't had a divorce i hope nothing I hope your you got time no is up oh is it up i can't hear you mayor much i can't Please. hear you because you're a coward you're a coward mayor Munch. and i'm coming i'm going to publicly embarrass every single person in this meeting you guys have not seen the last of prime time night I'm just telling you, you made a big mistake. You guys are fighting fire with fire. Please. Big mistake. The party has just begun. James Lockridge. Hello, Mr. Mums. How are you? I apologize. You're fine. Mr. Mayor, I've, I've tried to talk to you and uh, haven't had a phone call. The city manager as well. You know, I would love to visit with the city council and both of y'all at some point in time. Guys, y'all haven't responded. Um, right here, it says very clearly uh, the section C, uh, excuse my glasses there, 
Uh, no nuisance action may be brought against an agricultural operation that has lawfully been in operation for over more than one year prior to the date at which the action is brought, which is your laws that y'all enforced on the American farmers and ranchers. We were here long before your laws. We're grandfathered in. It very clearly says in section code section of the agricultural law 251.004, and that's what that law is. Y'all cannot enforce Texas farmers and ranchers to mow anything or enforce a height of a crop. You can't do anything to us if we were here long before your laws were passed, which I was, 1994. So therefore, I ask you to visit with me on this as quick as possible. Thank y'all. Thank you. Pat Greer. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I appreciate uh, you letting me speak. I'm Pat Greer. I've lived in Plano over 40 years, and I'm associated with Plano Citizens Coalition. And on behalf of that organization and personally, I would like to thank you for um, your acts of transparency recently in getting P and Z uh, in information in the hands of the public um, with just the click of a button on the computer. I do thank you very much. Thank you. With no further business, we're adjourned.